On this week in Enterprise Tech, we have Mr. Brian Chi and Mr. Curtis Franklin back on the show. Now, is this the year of derivative AI technology? We are seeing technology like this pop up all over the industry. We're going to talk about where and when and how. Let's keeping AI as a theme. What about using it in the hiring process as well? Today, we have Dan Finnegan. He's CEO of Filtered. We're going to discuss the current challenges each organization has with the hiring process and just where this type of technology might be able to optimize them. You definitely shouldn't miss it. Quiet on the set. Podcasts you love from people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twit. This week in Enterprise Tech, episode five twenty eight, recorded January twenty seventh, twenty twenty three. Chat GPT, take my job, please. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Collide. Collide is an endpoint security solution that gives IT teams a single dashboard for all devices, regardless of their operating system. Visit collide.com slash quiet to learn more and activate a free 14-day trial today. No credit card required. And by Worldwide Technology. With an innovative culture, thousands of IT engineers, application developers, unmatched labs, and integration centers for testing and deploying technology at scale, WWT helps customers bridge the gap between strategy and execution. To learn more about WWT, visit www.wwt.com slash quit. Welcome to Twiet This Week in Enterprise Tech, the show that is dedicated to to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and that geek who just wants to know how this world's connected. I'm your host, Louis Maresca, your guide through the big world of the enterprise. And what a big and busy world it is, and I can't guide you by myself. I need to bring in the professionals. So I'm going to bring on Mr. Curtis Franklin. He's senior analyst at Amdia, and he is the man who has the pulse of the enterprise. Curtis, it's always great to have you back, my friend. How's your week going? Oh, it's been a busy week. Um... You know, I have to say I have enjoyed the week because it's got one of the rare things we get to see, and that is a victory by the good guys. So it's not the biggest of victories. The feds managed to take down a ransomware group, but we'll take the victories where we can get them. And with that kind of joy and happiness, I'm ready to launch into the weekend after, of course, We've had a great time today on Twyatt. Indeed, indeed. Well, thank you, Curtis, for being here. Well, we also have to welcome back our very own Mr. Brian Cheese, net architect at Sky Fiber, and he's all around tech geek. Chebert, any, any toys you want to share this week? Any fun stuff? Well, I'm getting ready to drive down to Miami to go and visit um, what we call our Hanai godmother, uh, mm-hmm. kind of adopted. Uh, she used to be a New York fashion designer and wow. created Kathy's wedding gown from scratch. It was uh, quite spectacular. But I've also been kind of poking around trying to find what the market is for used fiber optics and finding out there's actually, if you're willing to go with like a dozen dozen fibers, you know, 144 fibers which is painful to, to uh, splice. Those are actually pretty cheap. In fact, some of the big spools up in about the 6,000 foot range, because not many people use those, um, they're going really cheap. So trying to decide if it's worth the pain to do, to put in a ginormous fiber backbone for the central Florida fairgrounds. Now, what, what is it put in context, what is really cheap? Um, I found a 6,000 foot spool that if I'm willing to pick it up from Cincinnati, uh, would cost me a whole $16. Wow. That is cheap. <laughs> uh, brand new, a composite fiber cable like that. Um, if you pick it up from the factory is probably going to be out about 20 or $30,000, but so few people use them that once they go surplus, um, they just want the yard space back. Right. right. So interesting. Interesting. You might've found a market there. Well done. Maybe. 
<laughs> Thanks, Jeevert. Well, speaking of busy, we have quite the busy week in enterprise. Now, have you ever heard of derivative AI? Well, it's, I think it's the year of derivative AI technology. We'll talk about just what that means and where we might see AI popping up in the industry. Plus, keeping AI as a theme, what about using it in your hiring process as well? Well, today we have Dan Finnegan, he's CEO of Filtered. We're going to discuss the current challenges companies and organizations have with the hiring process and just where technology might be able to optimize them. So definitely stick around. Lots to discuss there, but let's go ahead and jump into this week's news blips. Deep fakes have no bounds. Sure, there are entertaining to watch your favorite actors sing a song or do a dance, but what if they also were used to sign important documents and pay for things without you knowing? Well, this article over at Ars Technico examines a new technology called generative generative handwriting, which can be actually create realistic handwritten text using deep learning. Now, the technology uses a neural network to generate text that looks like it's handwritten by a human. It's not a font. doesn't look like one. It even has the, uh, you know, different strokes. The technology can be used to create a variety of different hand styles, uh, handwriting styles, as well as based on large data sets of handwritten samples. The technology is still in its early stages, but it could be used to create realistic looking handwritten documents or to generate unique handwriting styles for digital signatures. Now, calligraphy or calligrapher.ai draws each letter as if it were handwritten by a human guided by statistical weights. Weights. Now, though, those weights are actually came from a recurrent neural network, or RNN, that has been trained on the IM online handwriting database, which contains samples of handwritings from a large data set of individuals digitized from a whiteboard over time. Now, the, since the algorithm producing the handwritten is actually statistical in nature, its properties such as legibility can be adjusted dynamically. Now, for me, if this forces my attention to more of digitally signing things more, the, the more realistic documents appear by being signed by somebody else or even a technology creates even higher risk. Now, this could be used to forge documents or signatures, and it could be used uh, for you know, forging authenticity of, of, of documents. Now, if you want to think about digital signatures, the question is, are they safer? People can't forge them. Well, I feel they have much higher or much harder to forge. In fact, digital signatures are created using cryptographic techniques, and they're used as a combination of keys to verify the sign's identity and create a unique code. Now, the question is, can those be used in a malicious manner? Well, they can, but in less detail, less, less chance of doing that. I think that, uh, you know, maybe this technology might be forcing people to use digital signatures more. Well, let's talk about something we haven't mentioned in a while. Let's talk about printers. They're one of the items most of us don't think about as long as they spit out paper with ink on it. But most modern printers are actually network connected devices with sophisticated processors inside which means they're a target for threat actors. In the latest example of this, this week, Lexmark warned customers about a critical security vulnerability allowing remote code execution, which is affecting more than 120 different Lexmark printer models. Bug, designated CVE-2023-23560, carries a CVSS score of 9 out of 10. That means, for those who don't follow CVSS, is pretty darn bad. It earned the score by being a server-side request forgery vulnerability in the web services feature of about 120, as I said, newer Lexmark devices. Now, Lexmark has issued a firmware patch and has told customers that disabling web services on TCP port 65002 is a workaround for protection. In the case of the affected printers, the web server provides management features for the device, uh, as it does for many other types of printers. Uh, for attackers, printers are often overlooked devices that can provide convenient launch pads for attacks that spread throughout a network. And frankly, whether the printers that sit on your network are from Lexmark or not, it's worth taking a look and making sure that all of your printers are scanned, protected, and taken into account when it comes time to secure your enterprise network. I'd like to say thank you to the folks at Ars Technica 
for following this particular um, thread of stories. So basically, the headline is John Deere relents, says farmers can fix their own tractors after all. Well, in, farmers now have the right to repair their John Deere tractors themselves or through independent third parties, ending a lengthy battle with the agricultural machinery company. On last Saturday, John Deere and the American Farm Bureau Federation signed a memorandum of understanding outlining the company's responsibilities to provide diagnostic tools and software outside of the company's official authorized repair centers. The right for consumers to repair their own property, be that cars, electronics, or farm equipment, has been growing over the past few years, and with some states taking action to enshrine the right for their residents. Farmers have been at odds with John Deere since 2016, when the company changed its end-user license to require that any repairs involving embedded software be carried out only by authorized technicians. Like cars, modern tractors are now packed full of complicated electronics and the restrictions imposed upon farmers did eh, not go down well. Anyway, um, in July of 2021, U.S. President Joe Biden weighed in with an executive order that specifically mentioned this problem. Among other actions, the order called on the Federal Trade Commission to prevent, quote, unfair anti-competitive restrictions on third-party repair or self-repair of items, such as the restrictions imposed by powerful manufacturers that prevent farmers from repairing their own equipment. President Biden brought the issue up again six months later, saying that, quote, if you own a product from a smartphone to a tractor, you don't have the freedom to choose how or where to repair that item you purchase. Well, anyway, worth reading. Other articles are expressing their doubt, and this is from other publishers, um, all expressing their doubt that this is the end of that argument. And they're predicting that John Deere might attempt to wiggle out of the spirit of the agreement. Meanwhile, in the IT world, the ability to repair complex gear has gotten off to a rough start, with Apple having some issues with scheduling of special tools necessary to do some repairs under their at-home repair program. As the one-time repair person for Okidata and Toshiba printers in the Pacific, it was for us not the issue of getting access to tools, manuals, or parts, but rather not allowing warranty repair checks for anyone outside the authorized repair center world. While not a huge amount of money, it did include parts reimbursement and replacements and some labor money that made large-scale warranty repair a profitable endeavor for our repair center. Reversing the effects of aging is like the holy grail of science. Who would want to find or find a way to feel five or maybe even 10 years younger? Well, researchers at the University of Bristol and the Multimedica Group in Italy discovered a certain gene in a population of people who are over 100 years of old that helped keep their hearts young by protecting them against diseases like aging such as heart failure. The University of Bristol posted this news and talks about the new study, and it discovered an anti-aging gene that when administered to the heart failure patients could possibly rewind their heart's biological age by 10 years. Now, the gene referred to as the BPIFB4 gene, it has been shown to be associated with exceptionally longevity, well, exceptional longevity, and it's found to individuals in living more in blue zones of the planet who often live 100 years or more and remain in good hope, health. The gene helps to keep their hearts young by protecting them against diseases like aging and heart failure. And in their study, they actually administered the gene to mice and observed a process of cardiac rejuvenation, which actually gem demonstrated that the gene could actually, in fact, protect against heart failure. Now, the gene could potentially be used in a clinical trials and is seen as a potential target for patients with heart failure. You may be wondering, how is this gene actually activated? How can you get it? Now, you may, uh, according to the study, it actually activated and administered by a single dose of the mutant anti-aging gene, which is been shown to halt the decay of heart function in middle-aged mice and rewind the heart's biological clock of, by equivalent or more than 10 years. I don't know about you, but this Star Trek-like medicine can't come soon enough, so we can ensure we always have a way to voyage home. Well, folks, that does it for the blips. Next up, the bites. But before we get to the bites, we do have to thank a really great sponsor of this week, Enterprise Tech, and that's Collide. Now, you may know the old saying when the 
only tool you have is a hammer. Everything looks like a nail. You know that one? Well, the, the traditional approach to device security is that hammer. It's that blunt instrument that can't solve those nuanced problems that are out there. And even after installing clunky agents that users hate, IT teams still have to deal with mountains of support tickets over the same old issues. I've seen it with my own eyes, trust me. And they have no way to actually address things like unencrypted SSH keys or OS updates or pretty much anything going on with a Linux device. Collide is an endpoint security solution that's more like a Swiss army knife. It gives IT teams a single dashboard, that single pane of glass for all devices, Mac, Windows, and even Linux. You can query your entire fleet to check for common compliance issues or write your own custom checks. Now, plus, it's instead of installing intrusive software that creates more work for IT, Collide's lightweight agent shows end users how to fix issues themselves. You can achieve endpoint compliance by adding a new tool to your toolbox. Visit Collide.com slash twiet to find out how. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash twiet. And we thank Collide for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it's time for the bites. And today we're going to do a little round table. Uh, you know, I think that this might be the year of derivative AI. We will coin that phrase here first on Twi. That's right. Derivative AI is where existing artificial intelligence models and algorithms are used to as basically a starting point to create new and improved versions. Now, this approach allows developers to essentially stepping stone, step improve or incrementally improve existing AI technologies or even create entirely new models by combining different components from existing models. Sometimes we call those mix-ins or even hybrid AI. In the past, you know, we've seen this take on new forms. My question is, how trustworthy can this be? I'm going to bring my co-host in here because we were just recently kind of conversing about this, guys. And I, I, I know that we're starting to see some things kind of emerge. In fact, uh, one example was this recent new search engine that came out. Um, in regards to uh, perplexity, I think it's called. Um, and perplexity is interesting because uh, it, you know, it it combines the results of a search engine with Chat GPT uh, and is able to actually produce, they say, more relevant searches. What are you guys thinking here? Is, is this is this a good thing or is this a bad thing? Well, I will will leap in. Um, the The issue gets down to a, a single a, a single definition, and that is something that those of us who deal in things like analytics engines and uh, databases are aware of. The phrase is "source of truth," and whether you have a single source of truth for whatever results you're giving. Now, in things like uh, business analytics, uh, in most uh, business databases, what you desperately want is a single source of truth. In other words, you want to have one canonical source from which all your analytics draw, from which all of your, say, decisions on the, um, the credit worthiness of a particular customer draw. Single source of truth. The problem is out in the real world. You know, if you're asking a question like, what's the best soccer team? Well, getting a single source of truth on that is likely to be difficult because yeah, there are a lot of ways to, to define that. So what we're trying to do is find systems um, that do what perplexity has done in this great example that we're seeing. When you go and do something like a Google or Bing or DuckDuckGo query, what you get back is a page of results, at least one page, sometimes hundreds of pages of results. And as the consumer of information, you can go through those and decide which ones are authoritative, which ones are biased, which ones you like, which ones you don't. You get to make the decision. Especially if you ask something that is tied to a voice generator as a tool like 
chat GPT could easily be. When you hear it, you're likely to hear one answer, the top answer. And if you hear that in a human sounding voice, the odds are pretty good you're going to accept that as authoritative. So one of the big issues that people all over the AI world are, are wrestling with is how do you take this ambiguity that exists in the real world and build it into something that is likely to be accepted as authoritative on its face by the vast majority of consumers? It's a tricky question um, and, and one that involves not just programmers, but ethicists and user interface designers and, and a whole bunch of folks in the industry. Well, as you probably are noticed of your video, you probably see our another guest here. Uh, this is our guest. We're bringing him in a little early. Dan Finnegan, CEO of uh, Filtered. Uh, Dan, we wanted to bring you in because obviously a lot of technology that Filter's using is AI based. And, you know, we're starting to see this kind of as an uptick. We you know, a lot of open AI technologies has created a lot of buzz around the industry. We're starting to see it show up in a lot of different enterprising technologies. Now, in this particular case, what we're talking about from the merging of you know search results that are indexed data potentially you know untrusted sources with you know obviously that of gpt3's database um what do you think of that uh, i think the point <clears throat> just raised is exactly dead on you know um a lot of people are come you know brainstorming use cases for chat gpt and want to build a business on top of it it's the hops hottest topic here in silicon valley but there is some practical major point, and you just raised it, which is um, who owns the data? Whose data is this? Where did it come from? And, you know, one of the obvious use cases that have been played around with with some humor is you don't need to call a lawyer anymore. Just ask ChatGPT. It'll write a contract for you. And uh, there, that's the professional community that's going to get the most angry that there's no trademark consideration, copyright consideration, which is just a legal version of the same issue raised is where did this come from? Who says this? Um, you know, chat GPT sounds extremely confident and it seems like every answer it spits out is dead on. But um, the reality is we don't know where the information came from. We don't know really what's true or not true. And I don't know, I don't have any ideas on how it's going to solve that problem. Well, I think I'd like to jump in here. <clears throat> I think it's draw an analogy of Wikipedia. Um, there are some Wikipedia entries <clears throat> that, shall we say, are a little mushy. Um, the Wikipedia people try to go and put in comments saying you need sources, you need, you know, citations and so forth. Um, <clears throat> but especially when I was teaching high school or even younger college kids, they had this really bad habit of using Wikipedia as a um, do all end all source of information. And I basically said, no, 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 no. It, it is contributed by the community and we don't always know who contributed it. So, in certain industries, like in the IT world, Wikipedia tends to be nice and accurate, uh, especially when there's a lot of contributors. But I actually found some in the plumbing industry um, that were wildly inaccurate. So I think we're going to start seeing something really similar in the world of AI. Where is the data coming from? How well does it do? I, Actually, when the hosts were considering, you know, how we're going to pose this conversation, Lou actually brought up something about his kids, you know, and I'm going to throw it at Lou because that was a heck of a nice way of saying, you know, kids, do your homework. Lou, what, yeah, what did you do it, to your kids? The interesting thing is, you know, obviously we were talking a little bit about our voice assistants that are out there today. A lot of people use them, you know, in their daily lives to throw, you know, you know, throw questions at them, right? You know, who invented the light bulb or, or or whatnot, right? And a lot of times they throw questions at these devices that, you know, are complex. You know, they're, they are things that might be, um, you know, not necessarily, they're combined not only with historical data, 
but with a little bit of assumption. And so, you know, they'll throw some questions at it like, you know, what is the brightest star in the universe? Well, there are some data around that, but, you know, obviously we don't know exactly what the brightest star in the universe is because we haven't cataloged all the stars. And I think the interesting thing is what Alexa comes back with. And I think sometimes it comes back with, hey, you know, this is from another reader or another user on the Internet. We've been able to provide this. They've added these little vocal ticks, I basically guess you could say, to their answers to basically say, hey, this is not necessarily like potentially correct, but this is what other people have said or maybe what other people give thumbs up on. And I think it's helpful because not only that is my kids have sometimes said, wow, that doesn't seem right to us or, you know, that doesn't seem like the right answer. Maybe we should go look up and and research some more. And I think it's actually really helpful that I would go back to, you know, what everyone's saying about GPT-3. I've seen as much as to say, you know, hey, I've actually asked it, is this, are these websites, you know, trustworthy? Is this information good? Uh, And it said yes. And I've gone and looked at the site and it's not. Like it's it's not useful. It's not, it's not potentially 100% accurate. In fact, I've I've seen things where it's gotten, you know, actual names of things completely wrong. Uh, So I, I, there's just no accountability. Right. Um, And when you go on Google, you can see, well, where'd this website come from? And you develop the skill to judge yourself. If you read a, an academic paper, I mean, sometimes it's painful, right? Every fourth word, there's a little number because they're citating. Uh, there's a citation to some reference to another academic paper. You can't just say things in an academic paper without saying, where'd you get that assertion from? And I'm on the board of academia.edu and we publish papers. We enable academics to publish papers, citations is the most important feature of the platform. ChatGBT is the exact opposite of that. It is, it's, it's a, an exec summary writer. It's, um, it's, I don't, I, it's gonna have to be untangled to be useful, but otherwise there's zero accountability. You know, Dan raises an interesting point, and it brings up a, a fascinating area where we've seen Chat GPT find some of the most controversial use, and that is in academia. Uh, we know because of some, we'll call them experiments that have been done. Uh, Chat GPT has generated um, academic abstracts for papers where the, the papers have been accepted. Uh, we now know that chat GPT has been in at least one or two cases listed as a co-author on a paper, uh, leading some to say that chat GPT can't be a co-author on a paper. And right now there are teachers all over, especially secondary education who are worried that any homework they send home that has a um, an essay component is going to come back with something that was generated by chat gpt now there are ways to look at this i think it's fascinating and and has a whole bunch of sort of skynet science fiction aspect about it but there are ai engines they can analyze text to see if it was generated by an AI. AI. Um, and part of me says, we'll just let the machines fight it out and we'll sit back and, you know, have a pizza. Yeah. But this is a, a legitimate issue um, because it's, it's sort of the next step. Um, I'm old enough to remember that when I was in high school, I could not use a calculator in right. math classes. It wasn't until I got to university that I could use a calculator. Um, Now, of course, there are calculators for elementary school kids. So we've accepted that tool as part of a legitimate academic program. I suspect that ultimately we will reach a point where tools like ChatGPT find their use as legitimate tools, but getting there, defining what the parameters of that use are, defining 
how to signify that a particular piece of text was generated by chat GPT is going to take some time. And as, as our guest pointed out, one of the big issues is that chat GPT, chat GPT is absolutely crap at citations. Um, and believe me, when you go to graduate school, especially you spend half of your first term learning the correct format for citations for whichever school you are part of, whether you're, you know, using in, um, you know, using, um, APA style or Chicago style or some other style of citation, because citing wrong is equivalent to plagiarism. Right. And at most universities, plagiarism is instant dismissal. So it's a high stakes game if someone wants to use this. Um, but it's going to be, it's going to be fascinating to watch over the next two to five years. Just this week, someone used the calculator analogy. And I, I think you and I went to school a similar time and I remember years later thinking, thank God I didn't have a calculator when I was in kindergarten or junior high school because <clears throat> I had to learn the basics. Um, I worry with chat GPT and text words that writing is fundamental to thinking and communicating. And, um, and I do think the, every teacher out there is talking about this and is and literally doesn't know what the implications of this is for the education of our children and what it could get in the way of teaching if we're not careful. It's, I think it is fascinating. Um, there's clearly a lot of use cases. They're going to be highly convenient and beneficial. Um, but I mean, this is the first in my tech industry experience that I've seen where, ooh, this this feels unknowable right now. Well, we have a lot more to talk about when it comes to AI, and we're going to actually bring Dan back in in just a moment. Mm -hmm. But before we do, we do have to thank another great sponsor of this week, Enterprise Tech, and that is Worldwide Technology. And I have followed Worldwide Technology for a while, and they are trailblazers in the world of technology. They are at the forefront of innovation, working with clients all over the world to transform their business. At the heart of WWT lies its Advanced Technology Center, or their ATC. Now, the ATC is a research and testing lab that brings together technologies from leading OEMs. There's more than a half a billion dollars, a ton of equipment in there, and they're invested in their lab. And the ATC offers hundreds of on-demand and schedulable labs featuring solutions that include technologies representing the newest advances in cloud security networking, primary and secondary storage, data analytics, and AI, DevOps, and so much more. Now, WWT's engineers and partners use the ATC quickly to spin up proofs of concept and pilots so customers can confidently select the best solutions. This helps cut evaluation time from months to weeks. Now, with the ATC, you can test out products and solutions before you go to market, access technical articles, expert insights, demonstration videos, white papers, hands-on labs, and other tools that help you stay up to date with the latest technology. Not only is the ATC a physical lab space, WWT also virtualized it. That's right, members of their ATC platform can access these amazing resources anywhere in the world, 365 days a year. Now, while exploring the ATC platform, make sure to check out WWT's events and communities for more opportunities to learn about technology trends and hear the latest research and insights from their experts. Whatever your business needs, WWT can deliver scalable, tried and tested, tailored solutions. WWT brings strategy and execution together to make a new world happen. To learn more about WWT, the ATC, and gain access to all their free resources, visit WWT.com slash twit and create a free account on their ATC platform. That's WWT.com slash twit and we thank wwt for their support of this week in enterprise tech 
Well, folks, it's my favorite part of the show. We actually get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twyat Riot, and we can bring back on Dan Finnegan. He's CEO of Filtered. Welcome to the show, Dan. We didn't get a chance to welcome you before. Oh, thank you very much. It's really a privilege to be here. It's fun. Thank you. Now, all right, just before we get started and talking about more about technology, AI, all that stuff, our yeah. audience comes from all different levels and points in their career, and they love to hear people's origin stories. Can you take people? maybe the audience through your journey through tech and what brought you to filter? Sure. Um, well, I, I was a lost graduate student in my twenties, you know, didn't know if I was going to be a, a professor of, of, uh, communications. I was at the university of Pennsylvania at the Annenberg school and I was in the graduate program and I thought that's what I was going to do. And then I needed to get a job and I was, I found a job as a fundraiser and administrator of a research center in the in School of Engineering and Applied Science led by Professor Dave Farber. And um, he introduced me to this thing called the internet. This is in the late 80s. And I got lost down the, the rabbit hole of Usenet groups. In fact, my first stereo speaker set I bought from a recommendation from a Bell Labs engineer 1988 or so, 89. Um, and I was then became a freelance reporter at night to make extra money. Just been married, had a kid in the PhD program, and also working at this research center. So I was pretty lost. Um, and then um, I met a funder of our research center, Bell Lanik. He's kind of my first mentor, who said, you're a reporter at night, aren't you? I go, yeah. Well, we're going to do a experiment with the Philadelphia Inquirer, where you write, publish newspapers over the telephone lines into news into uh, your TV set, and I was fascinated by that. Called it video text. It would broadcast via that line that when your old TV would swipe through, and um, then I saw. In 1994, the Mosaic browser, and I thought, oh my God, the, the internet's going to become like a Apple Macintosh. And I've been um, pursuing the industry ever since. I mean, I led it with a team as an analyst at the LA Times. We bought 3% of Netscape for 3 million bucks. And six months later, I was trying to buy this thing called www.aki.bono.yahoo.edu, um, .stanford.edu, excuse me, and a thing called the Monster Board, um, because newspapers were threatened by the, the emerging business models on the internet. So I've been in it ever since. It's, I've been extremely fortunate, right place at the right time. I've had a wonderful career in technology and I guess I always say to um, young people in their 20s, relax, you're going to live a long life, try things. Your, your only job right now is to figure out what you're not going to like. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Now, I think, you know, the interesting thing about Filtered itself, now that we, we kind of go back <clears throat> into the company, is the fact that, you know, the hiring process is somewhat broken i think in the tech industry you know there are a lot of different corporations they do it all differently some of them good some of them bad i've been doing this for 20 years i can tell you that i sometimes like to keep myself fresh i'll go interview companies uh, every year just some just to kind of get an idea of what's out there and also keep up on the interview process and i can tell you a lot of them don't do a good job like they just don't do a good job um, you know for instance you know resumes are not always a good indicate indicator of talent Whiteboards are not always a good understanding of whether they are good at something or not. Um, and I think that organizations have a lot of problems. What are problems that you are seeing in, in this space and what organizations are having? Well, I think um, recruiting of engineers is the one of the most important and painful processes in any company because every company is becoming a, a tech company now, really. Everyone's moving their business to the cloud and trying to digitally transform themselves. And what it means is you got a lot of people who don't know how to recruit engineers, recruiting engineers. Um, 
you know, the pain points that we hear about that you alluded to, some of them are, it can be either A, um, I don't really know what I'm doing. I, I, I know how to read resumes. And the people in engineering, uh, they don't invest the time that I need them to invest. The people in engineering are feel like, oh my God, you don't know what you're doing. And you keep passing on candidates who aren't what I described and aren't qualified. And the, most importantly, the candidates themselves feel like the questions they're asked are irrelevant. They don't have a sense of what the job would really be like if I worked there. It's too time consuming. I got to interview with everybody. Um, and so it is broken and it is painful. And what appealed to me about Filtered, it was the second time I joined as the CEO of a venture funded, very small startup as the 20th employee here. Um, at Javite, I was the 10th employee. I love startups. But what really appealed to me was the notion that um, doesn't it just matter if you can do the job? And when I met the founders, it was after the pandemic. You know, interviewing now is all virtual. We used to only we used to only interview people within a 40 mile radius of our office. Now we're, oh my God, I can interview anybody anywhere. Engineers are all over the world. And um, but they don't um they don't know how to do it. And it's really about getting the job, having the skills for the job. There's this movement in recruiting called skills-based hiring in a world of DEI and office culture doesn't really matter as much anymore. Can you do the job? And the founder told me, I kept submitting candidates to engineering teams that weren't being interviewed because they just didn't have the right resume. And I just felt like if they could prove that they could actually do it because they like doing it and they're good at it and they do it all the time, then performance over pedigree was the, 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 the phrase that they coined that really appealed to me. That's cool. That's interesting. Yeah, I have a similar experience. I've seen organizations. In fact, I was at a conference a while back. And I had met an individual, really liked them, uh, you know, really highly skilled at what they were doing. Great conversations, great ideas with, you know, a lot of my coworkers were with me and we just, we knew of an open position in another company and we said, Hey, you should apply. You should go there because I think you'd be a great candidate. And, you know, they went and did, they got their conference contact information. And I'd say without two months later, they messaged me and said, Hey, I, I never got a call. I never got, you know, I never got, um, you know, called up. I said, send me your resume that you, you sent them. And so they did. And I looked at it and that was a great resume. I think it was definitely on point with even the, the position they were applying for. So I emailed the hiring manager. I said, you should take a look at this person. Like they're highly qualified. Guy got hired. And I think the interesting thing about that is where, where did that, where did it go wrong? Why, why didn't his resume get through the system? And what they found out was the recruiter was using somewhat of a filtering technology that tried to match skills on a resume to yeah. job descriptions and it didn't match. And they just never got through the first layer of that. And then they got filtered out is, is what, what, what is, is AI helping this? Is it making this better? Because I still think companies are using this type of filtering technology. Well, that's a really good question. You're talking to someone who may have been one of the first to build a machine learning algorithm when I was the CEO of Hot Jobs in uh, 2004, 5, and 6, that would read a marketing document called the job description and read a marketing document called the resume and then track the data of who, how far down the funnel in the recruiting process they got to, um, to recommend jobs to people when they applied and recommend candidates to people when they were searching. And um, it starts with the fundamental raw data, which is their marketing documents. And um, keywords and resumes, it created a, a phenomena, especially in engineering, where people would just pack their resumes with the names of skills that they thought mattered. And they were, it's easy to exaggerate just because because you've used Java a couple of times doesn't mean it's 
the same Java skill set that someone who's been only working in Java for five years. But the software sees it as the same thing and you get recommended. Um, so I do think that AI and machine learning algorithms in recruiting software accelerate the patterns, which may not be very accurate. Right. I want to get into that a little bit more because obviously, you know, I like I like talking about resumes because they tend to uncover biases and processes. Um, and I think that one of them being, for instance, let me go back to the example I gave before uh, was around this person. They were they were actually uh, had a uh, they had a master's in history and they were going, but they had worked in the industry for 15 years in technology. Great leader um, had used to manage large teams, let's say 30, 40 people um, up to 100 people at, at some point. Um, and was really successful there. Um, and their in their resume didn't necessarily say that. It just said they were manager, that they you know dro drove technology, was successful. This here's some of the things that they achieved, that kind of thing. And then of course their background of being history. Um, you know, and the interesting thing is that the job was for a large director position that managed large teams. And I think the what came back was this person probably is not qualified because they probably never. Not only do they have a history degree, but they they. They just, they just really haven't been able to manage at that scale before. Um, and so, and so they were again, weeded out, uh, because of that, you know, these types of biases, AI, these type of models, are they able to say, Hey, based off of this person's history companies, they work for, it looks like they potentially have the leadership skills, even though they don't come out and say it in the, in the, uh, in, inside the, the resume. And so it still allows them to to apply or be part of the candidate. Is, is this something that AI can do is, is push aside some of those bias? It, it, eventually, I think it can. It requires um, inclusion into the, into the recommendation engine, if you will, some element of performance, uh, job performance data. Right. We're still really early on in that. I mean, Workday um, was one of the first companies to promise that it would take the feedback loop and success factors of of um, performance data in a company and have that reinforce the recommendation of candidates. No one's done it yet. There's other startups that claim that they've done a good job of that. Um, <clears throat> we'll eventually get there. Um, one way to deal with it is, you know, human trained algorithms are what really work best anyway. And we you know what we tried to do um, in my previous company, and what I really strongly believe in it filtered is to um, leverage the expertise of the users of our software to learn from it. So if we're going to have expert people interview engineers in our live rooms product, well, then what could we put in front of them that we can later use as invaluable data to determine they like the candidate? Um, but I think the most difficult thing that you raise is that the recruiting process is one of risk aversion oftentimes. Mm -hmm. And um, people in HR and talent acquisition don't want to be made fun of by their engineering leaders that they passed on a candidate that wasn't qualified. So they try to really focus on the, only the ones they know are the types of people they would hire. So it takes leaders to take risks to expand the criteria they're willing to consider for jobs. I've talked about this for years. I mean, not in engineering, but if you notice that every job requires a college degree, that's ridiculous. And so by definition, we need to be more open-minded when we consider talented people for jobs. Right, right. Well, I do wanna bring my co-host back in because they, they have a lot of experience here and they of course have a lot of questions, I'm sure. Uh, Chibert, you wanna go first? Yeah. I'm. I'm just going to bring up that old saw about garbage in, garbage out. You know, we all know that old saw. And I always have thought that an AI is only as good as what you teach it. And that's why I'm hoping, you know, because I started off as, you know, a tech and grew up. And I, I realized very, very early on in my career that I stink as a manager, but I'm a great team lead. And the problem is <clears throat> I've dealt with hundreds of HR groups now 
And not a single HR group differentiates between a team lead and a manager. It's frustrating. And uh, I had a very interesting conversation with a director at IBM Global Services. And he says, you should be working for us. I get, I told him, I applied to IBM nearly 20 times in between every single job I've had in my entire career. I've applied at IBM and you guys blew me off. And I just got dead silence out of him. So I guess the, the thing I'd like to pose to you is... <clears throat> How are you teaching your AI? Um, do you have groups of people? Are you trying to identify the people that actually know how to interview to teach your AI how to interview? Oh, good question. Um, I, uh, we had filtered, um, tried to stimulate the job as closest, uh, whether that's front end programmer, back end and programmer, full stack, data science or DevOps, to simulate the job as it would be in the environment, as if we shipped you the laptop that you would use on the first day of the job. And then ask you not just to solve one little particular skill, but to build a little mini application. And the reason we do that is we think doing the job allows someone to demonstrate their skills as opposed to just describe them. Now, to get your point about AI, so right now, as a small, fast-growing startup, I would argue we don't have enough data to be smart to make recommendations yet. I remember years and years ago, I was on a panel, and there was some AI startup. This must have been like seven years ago. And he was talking about all the algorithm you can do. And I remember saying, you don't have any data, so you can't do anything yet. And it took years for Jobvite to build enough data to have actually strong, I think we had very good, well-trained data to, to rank candidates in the system. It filtered right now, we're collecting data and we're building data models because I don't want to get this wrong. If we're asking applicants to create a shopping cart and draw data from an API and display it in a UI uh, that simulates the kind of front end work that you would be doing and back end work you would be doing, I, I, that's good enough. We're sharing with our customers additional signals about that candidate that you would not get if you just took a coding test. Well, one more question for you. In dealing with all these various HR groups, the number one complaint was I never have enough people to check people's references. And it occurs to me that Reference checking, especially credential checking, um, is a service that might be perfect for an AI. Um, is this something the industry is actually asking for, or am I just wishing in the wind? <laughs> oh, you're right. I mean, as someone, we've already used the analogy of Google. What made Google different was it was an algorithm that took into account the traffic and referrals to other websites. And so the Websites that got higher rank were the ones that the crowd on the web was starting to like. Um, and we don't do that when you just match a resume to a job description. So um, references do matter. Uh, there with blockchain technology, a lot of companies got funding to see if they could be the ultimate um, uh, source of truth, as which was stated earlier, about someone's um, background and work experience that would verify they are who they are, they did what they did, verify their education, but then also verify certain references. We all know LinkedIn tried to do this with, with their comments and recommendations and it just became kind of spam, right? So um, I think there is no, there's the, there's the references that a candidate gets you, and then there's the back channels people do when they go on LinkedIn. But um, there have been some companies that have come out that have been creative in leveraging the social web. But AI and machine learning applied to someone's um, reputation. Um, I haven't seen it yet. It can, it's certainly possible, but as you said, it's about garbage in, garbage out. And I'd be really careful about 
where you get the referenced information. One of the things that I'm interested in is looking at it from a slightly different perspective, and that is from writing the qualifications. Yeah. I mean, I one of the things that I had uh, fun with this last week, uh, and I'm going to be writing an article about this for Dark Reading next week, I went over to chat GPT and asked it to write a couple of ads for me. Yeah. Uh, one for a security analyst and one for a cyber researcher. And I have to say, That's I've good. seen worse. <laughs> um, and, you know, one of my questions, and, and I, I, I think it'll be interesting. I don't know. I, I think you could look at it as either chat GPT is very good at doing this or that as an industry, we're using an awful lot of the same verbiage in all our ads. Um, you know, is there any advantage to using verbiage in an ad that is tailored specifically for your instance or when it comes to something like a researcher or an analyst or, or any technical position is one set of words pretty much as good as another when it comes to a given level of expertise in a company? Wow. This is a huge topic. And in the recruiting world, it could have a whole panel just on this. Um, and this, this, this actually better um, covers the garbage in garbage out concept than anything. Um, <clears throat> There's been a lot of interesting work around job descriptions lately. Um, they used to be tiny little things because you had to advertise them in expensive media. Then they became very wordy things in a job board. And then when they were optimized for job boards like search engine optimization, then they became really wordy documents. Um, uh, I've heard, by the way, it's a, like one of the biggest topics about ChatGPT and recruiting is that companies are already starting to use ChatGPT to write job descriptions. And you ask, you know, is that good or bad? I don't know. Um, one thing that's been the most fascinating application of AI and machine learning to recruiting was to discover that certain words in a job description um, attract um, uh, women and certain words repel women. Certain words attract people of color and certain words repel people of color. And that, if you think about it, it's like, it's what you said. We're just redoing the same habit over and over. And people typically just cut and paste a job description. They go online, they go to Google job description for, you know, cut and paste it. They're moving fast. They don't have enough time. And not enough thought is put into job descriptions. And if you ask candidates, and there's been a lot of surveys on this from Glassdoor to Indeed. Um, candidates don't think job descriptions mean anything. And most often, job dissatisfaction within a year of being hired is referred back to the original job description. Like it's not the job they describe. And interesting. But, and I think not enough thought is put in by hiring managers of what do you really want? Um, so, and recruiters, of course, they want it to be a very broad job description so that it attracts the most candidates as possible. And if you try to get a, a, a recruiter or a talent acquisition person on a very narrow job description, they'll push back. But maybe that's what we need more is descriptions that are more literally describe the job that they would do. Well, my, my last very brief question is this. If you are a traditional recruiter, how nervous are you about AI in the industry? Well, I think um, like all lot, all kinds of white collar work identified by McKinsey a few years ago about what work will be automated and what work won't be automated. Chat GPT has quickly, in, in a matter of weeks, opened our eyes that what we used to call white collar work or um, is going to be automated. And in the recruiting process, certain steps are going to be automated. And um, it filtered. You can interview and 
prove and demonstrate that you can create uh, front end programs, that you know how to take data and write an algorithm without bothering someone's live interview time. That essentially automates the initial interviewing process. So as a recruiter, the analogy I always use is that when the internet first came out, everyone thought the realtor's job would go away. You can just go online, look at a home, and buyers and sellers could meet. Who would need realtors? Um, back before the internet, seeing, I think half of all Californians were realtors. There's fewer of them, but they're more productive. And so I would say for the recruiting industry, that's what's going to happen. It's going to force recruiters to focus on the things they can do that chat GPT can't, which is to have a real conversation with a hiring manager about what their goals and what they seek and have a real conversation with a candidate about their hopes and dreams and try to be the matchmaker um, that usually is what attracted people to that profession. Um, but a lot of the other work that they do that I would call busy work and recruiting, it's going to be automated from AI and machine learning. I think so as well. I think so as well. Well, Dan, it, it, time flies when you're having fun. This has been a great conversation. Thank you so much for being here. Now we're getting a little low on time, but we wanted to maybe give you a chance to tell the folks at home a little bit more about Filtered, where they can go, where their organizations can get started, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Well, um, hiring managers in engineering, and data science and DevOps, and certainly the talent acquisition professionals and recruiting professionals who, who work with them and support them can come to Filtered and uh, get a demo and see how we can essentially automate and streamline their recruiting process. We customize job simulation, so it, it is literally like giving uh, the engineer the laptop they would use on the first day in the job, have a, create a virtual terminal for them, uh, we auto score the results of the simulations. And this is so that this, the qualified candidates who can actually do the job um, get advanced in the process. And candidates learn what the job would be really like. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again, Dan. Well, folks, you've done it again. You sat through another hour of the best tech enterprise and IT podcast in the universe. So definitely tune your podcatcher to Twyet. I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to my wonderful co-host. Sorry, there, very own Mr. Brian Chi Chibert. What's going on for you in the coming week, and what, where can people find you and get a hold of you? Oh, all kinds of fun. But I, I will go and make a mention. Um, Dan didn't say it, but it's. His website is filtered.ai. Uh, so make sure you're going to the right um, website. If you go to filtered.com, you're going to get some interesting results. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you bet. Anyway, as, as the producer for the show, you know, I don't want to produce the show in a vacuum. I'd love to hear suggestions from you. One of the easiest ways right now for me is Twitter. Um, and my Twitter handle is ADVNETLAB, Advanced Net Lab. This is a leftover from my days as a re oceanographic researcher at the University of Hawaii. I brag about the Undersea Observatory a lot. Um, I will actually post all kinds of interesting things. We will also make sure we highlight um, some of the threads that we're trying to do. Obviously, there are lots and lots of people interested in AI. It is a white hot topic. So obviously, we're going to try and get guests in the AI thread. We're also going to hit things like IoT, um, you, know, sing, you know, zero trust, you name it. We want to hear from you. We want to hear what you want to see and you want conversations for. So throw it at me on Twitter. You're also welcome to throw it at me on my email. I am Chebert, spelled C-H-E-E-B-E-R-T at twit.tv. You can also send email to twiet at twit.tv and that'll hit all the hosts. Oh, and for the people that have been asking, Chebert is a leftover from when I was teaching at the University of Hawaii in computer science. And it was... Um, we had a Dilbert naming convention for our servers in the lab. And of course, because we had Dilbert, I had to be Chebert. 
That's the story. Want to hear from you? Everybody stay safe. Thank you, Cheever. Appreciate you being here. Well, we also have to thank our very own Mr. Curtis Franklin. Curtis, what's going on for you the coming weeks? Where can people find you and all your work? Well, as always, people can find me at omnia.com. Uh, our subscribers uh, get first crack at most of what I do over there. Um, I write for Dark Reading. I'm doing stuff on LinkedIn and I am getting ready, starting to make my plans for the RSA conference, which is coming up in just a couple of months. I've already got my plane tickets. I've got a hotel room booked at an outrageously high price. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing members of the Twyatt Riot out there in San Francisco. In the meantime, you can find me on Twitter. I'm at kg 4 GWA. I'm on Mastodon, um, uh, kg4.asdp.org, uh, and uh, also follow me on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook. I'm practically everywhere. So uh, find me online. Reach out. I'd love to know what you think about Twyatt and what we should be doing here for your benefit. Thank you, Curtis. Well, folks, we also have to thank you as well. You're the person who drops it each and every week to get your enterprise goodness. And we want to make it easy for you to watch and listen to catch up on your enterprise and IT news. Go to our show page right now. That's right. Twit.tv slash Twyatt. There you'll find all the amazing back episodes, the show notes, the co-host information, our guest information, of course, of course, the links that we do during the show. But more importantly, next to those videos there, you'll get those helpful subscribe and download links. Support the show by getting your audio version or your video version of your choice. Listen on any one of your devices because we're on all of them. And we want to make sure that you subscribe and support the show. Plus, well, you may have also heard we also have Club Twit. That's right. It's a members only ad free podcast service with a bonus twist bonus twit plus feed that you can't get anywhere else. And it's only seven dollars a month. That's right. And there's a lot of great things that come with it. And one of them is the exclusive access to the members only discord server that's right chat with hosts producers have separate discussion channels lots of fun of lots of fun stuff on there a lot of great channels to talk about plus they also have some special events that are exclusive only to it so definitely check that out join club twit be part of that go to twit.tv slash club twit now also you may have also heard club twit offers offers corporate group plans as well. It's a great way to give your team access to our ad free tech podcast. And the plans start with five members and it's a discounted rate of $6 each per month. And you can add as many seats as you like to that. And this is really a great way for your IT departments, your developers, your tech teams, any one of your teams to really stay up to date and access to all of our podcasts. And just like regular memberships, it's you can join the Twit Discord server and get that Twit Plus bonus feed as well. So definitely join Club Twit at twit.tv slash club twit now you may have also heard us talk about it it's twit audience survey time that's right it's the annual survey it really helps us understand our audience you so we can help you make your listening experience even better it only takes a couple minutes and it's about to end january 31st so go right now twit.tv slash survey 23 to take it don't wait last day is january 23rd 31st sorry 31st it's coming up so please get your voice in. We really want to hear from you. Check that out right now. Twit.tv slash survey23. Now, after you subscribe, impress your friends, your family members, your coworkers with the gift of Twyatt, because we talk a lot about fun tech topics on this show, and we guarantee they will find it fun and interesting as well. So definitely share the gift of Twyatt. If you want to watch the show live, we do this show live at live.twit.tv at 1.30 p.m. Pacific time on Fridays. Come see how the pizza's made, all the behind the scenes, all the banter that we do during the show and after the show. Check that out live at twit.tv. And if you want to watch the show live, jump into our IRC channel as well. IRSC.twit.tv. There we have some amazing people in there. They always give us some great ideas. They give us some good topics, some good questions, and of course, some good show titles as well. So definitely check all the great people in there at IRC.twit.tv. If you want to get a hold of me, you can always hit me up on Twitter at LouMM. Um, also, LinkedIn's a great place as well. I talked to a lot of people on there. In fact, I have a backlog that I have to go through and I will go through right now uh, after the show 
uh, because I want to make sure I get back to everybody on there. So definitely hit me up at LuMM on Twitter or on LinkedIn, Louis Bresca on there. Direct show, you know, direct message me, show ideas, topics, whatever you want. Even I talked to somebody recently about how getting getting started in programming and tech. So definitely hit me up on there anytime, anywhere. Appreciate it. If you want to know what I do during my normal work week at Microsoft, please go to developers.microsoft.com slash office. There we post all the amazing and great ways for you to customize the office experience to make it more customizable for you, to make it more productive for you, to make it more using your workflows that you have, automate things. Check that out. Definitely check out our newest, the latest, the greatest thing, Office Scripts, which allows you to, to write these cross-platform macros that run anywhere in the cloud. You can even schedule them and run them through Power Automate. So definitely check that out at developers.com, developers.microsoft.com slash office. I want to thank who everyone who makes this show possible, especially to Leo and Lisa. They continue to support This Week at Enterprise Tech each and every week, and we couldn't do the show without them. So thank you for all their support over the years. Of course, I want to thank Mr. Brian Chi one more time. He's not only our tireless producer, but he's not only our co-host, but he's also our tireless producer. And he does all the show bookings and the plannings for the show. So thank you, Chibert for all your support over the years. And of course, I want to thank all the engineers and staff at Twit. And before we sign out, I want to thank our editor, Mr. Anthony. Today, he makes us look good after the fact. He takes out all of my mistakes. So I appreciate that, Anthony. Of course, I also want to thank our technical director, our TD for today, Mr. Ant Pruitt. He makes it look easy, but it is not easy to make us look good. So thank you, Ant, for all your support. And of course, he does an amazing show here on Twit called Hands-On Photography, where you get to learn about different techniques and different they have different things within the world of photography every week. What's what's going on this week in, in the show, Ant? Thank you, Mr. Lou. Uh, this week, I get to play around with a couple toys, uh, drone in particular. People have asked about drones, and I share my thoughts. And, you know, stuff like getting Part 107 certified and why that matters and why a lot of folks probably ain't going to do it. So check it out, twit.tv slash H-O-P for hands-on photography. If you want to see some serious drone footage, check out the new uh, video around the Mission Impossible movie that's coming out soon with the uh, cliffhanging oh, drone footage. Oh, yes, pretty please. Amazing. Yes, please. Pretty amazing. <laughs> Thanks, Ed. Well, until next time, I'm Louis Moresca just reminding you, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet. If you are looking for a midweek update on the week's tech news, I got to tell you, you got to check out Tech News Weekly. See, it's all kind of built in there with the title. You get to learn about the news in tech that matters. Every Thursday, Jason Howell and I talk to the people making and breaking the tech news, get their insights and their interesting stories. It's a great show to check out. Twit.tv slash TNW.